Good day, stat students. So today we're going to talk about uh, the continuous world. Uh, before we were talking about discrete stuff, okay. Now we're going to talk about continuous random variables. So, with regards to the probability of, of a continuous random variable, any continuous random variable, um, basically it is equal to the area under a curve, believe it or not. <clears throat> and um, let me kind of develop it a little bit um, by using a, a problem that we're sort of familiar with already. So we already used this one before. The heights of all U.S. adult males are bell-shaped with a mean of 70, standard deviation of 4 inches. And so since I said the word all here, we're talking about a population, right? And so we're talking about the population mean is equal to 70, and the population standard deviation is equal to 4. So we got a mu of 70 and a sigma of 4, okay? Now I went ahead and put this on a... Uh, bell-shaped curve, got 70 here, right, standard deviation of 4, so 4 units this way, right, so we get to about 3, and then this way, 3, all right, uh, you know, 3 standard deviations this way, and so remember our z-scores, uh, when we go out one standard deviation in the positive direction, we got positive 1 for z-score, positive 2, positive 3, right, so a z-score of, say, 2.83 means that uh, the observation is 2.83 standard deviations above the value of the mean. <clears throat> And then if we have a negative 1.5, uh, let's say, that's telling us that the observation is 1.5 standard deviations below the mean, because the z-score is negative, all right? So hopefully that's everything that you've seen before. Well, remember this, is that if I drew a line here, and I drew a line here, okay, uh, how much of the data is located within one standard deviation of the mean? Well, hopefully you said, well, based upon the empirical rule, that's about 68%, okay? And so we're going to use that idea to help us then understand then um, this probability stuff with regards to uh, area under a curve, okay? So keep this idea in mind. So the PDF of a continuous random variable is a curve. It's, it's actually a formula, so very complicated formulas, in fact. And so you can imagine that there's a pretty complicated formula that would create this curve, okay? So we're not going to go over those complicated formulas. That's meant for a different stats course, okay? Um, but I guarantee you that there is a formula that's associated with these, okay? Um, the second thing is that uh, we got to associate that, um, that the area under this curve is always 1 or 100%. And believe it or not, we've been doing this uh, since, I don't know, third, fourth grade. I don't know. You know, I don't know the first time that you ever saw a pie chart, okay? But remember, you know, with the pie chart, the total area here is what? It's, if you shade in the whole thing, it's what? 100%, okay? And then if we went ahead and said, okay, well, let's do a, that's supposed to be a quarter. Mm -hmm. And then we shaded in that, okay? And we said, okay, well, whatever category, category is associated with that shading in, that we know that that happened, what, 25% of the time. Well, that's what's going on here, is that it's just that it's for an irregular shape, not, not for a circle, okay? So you got to think that underneath this curve to this axis, there's 100% of, of that curve there or an area of 1, okay? And then um, we know that if we go ahead and shade in this area, okay, that we know that 68% of the data is sitting there. Well, if 68% of the data is sitting there, that means the probability that X is between, what, 66 and 74 is going to be, what, 0.68 or 68%, okay? So uh, probability is equal to area under a curve, okay? And so we can visualize this area by the percentage under the curve that is shaded. For instance, uh, so we had 68% there, right? Well, if I only shaded, say, from here to here, okay, and said, well, what's the probability of being from 78 to 78.2, or whatever that is, and you look at that and go, well, I didn't shade in much, did I? Well, that's going to be a small probability. But if I shaded in, say, from 59 to 81, and I shaded practically the whole thing, okay, I practically shaded in from here all the way over, okay? Well, we know that the probability of that happening is going to be closer, closer to 1, okay? So we can visualize all this stuff. 
And so here, uh, like I said, with the empirical rule, okay? So from the probability from 66 to 74 is what? It's approximately 68, okay? So we're gonna be able to actually um, figure out then, you know, when we have things that uh, don't go along with the empirical rule, you know, so if we have an area that's associated like with this, we can now figure that out uh, based upon what we're learning in this section, okay? That we, we aren't constrained to the empirical rule where it's just one, two, and three standard deviations away in both directions from the mean, okay? All right, uh, the first rule I think most people can handle with the area under the curve, okay? It's the second one that needs a little bit more development. Here, um, notice what I said here is that if x is a continuous random variable, the probability that x is equal to any value is equal to zero. It's equal to zero, okay? And so um, a lot of people don't like that, uh, but let me give you an example, okay? Let's say you weigh yourself and the scale indicated 120 pounds. Well, my question to you is that do you really weigh exactly 120 pounds? You know, I have a scale that goes to the tenth of a well, actually not a tenth of a pound, it'll give you 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, things like that. So let's say that I used my scale and it said 120.2 pounds, okay? Well, whatever whatever I was weighing, did it, what do you think? Did, I, uh, did it weigh exactly 120.2 pounds? Well, if you had a scale, maybe that was precise enough, maybe it said uh, 0.24. Well, I got to keep on asking the same question. Do you think that thing weighed exactly 120.24? Well, let's say we could have had a scale that took it out to this many decimal places. And my same question, do you weigh exactly that, 120.243157? The answer is no, because we can always take it out, what, another decimal place, okay? Thus, we call it continuous, okay? It can take on any value, okay? So the probability that any value, okay, the probability that x is equal to any value is zero, okay? So you might be wondering, hold on, Doug, if, if all these x's are zero, where are their probabilities? There's got to be a probability of somewhere, okay? Well, we could say the following is that there is a probability that x is between 119 and 121. So notice what I did there. I created an interval, an interval, okay? So what would be considered an interval? Something like this, where x is in between two numbers. Or I could say something like this, where the probability where x is greater than some number, okay, or less than some number. All three of those would be considered intervals, okay? And so um, whenever we're working in the continuous world, okay, we're going to see intervals. Because if you start seeing the probability that x is equal to any value, that's automatically zero, okay? Doesn't matter if it's uh, weight or time. You know, let's say that you were timing something, okay, it, uh, and and whatever device you were using, it said uh, uh, 54.3 seconds. Well, was it exactly 54.3 seconds? No. Uh, 54.3286 seconds. No. You know, it could always be more precise, okay. And so, uh, and that that happens with pretty much all measurements, okay. And so for the continuous stuff, the probability of x is equal to any value is zero. So we're going to look at intervals instead, okay? Now, this flies right in the face in the discrete world. With the discrete world, it's the exact opposite. Remember in the discrete, uh, discrete uh, world where we had a table? We said here's x, and the probability that x can assume any value, okay? We can write it out in a table, okay? That's supposed to be a little x there. And then we said zero, right? And then we had one, and we had two. And we said maybe uh, zero shows up 50% of the time, so 0.5. One shows up 40% of the time, 0.4. Two shows up 10% uh, of the time, 0.1, okay? So notice the probability that x is discrete, excuse me, so let's assume that x is discrete. The probability that x is equal to a specific number, we can just look it up, okay? In the continuous world, okay, that would be zero, and we would have to throw it in an interval, <clears throat> okay? So that's those. That's the major rule that you have to keep straight between discrete and continuous, okay? 
all right so um let's talk about more specifics with regards to uh, um, a random variable that's uh, continuous so like the binomial that is a specific discrete random variable we have a normal random variable that is a specific continuous random variable and since a normal random variable is a specific continuous one we have to talk about its characteristics remember we talked about a binomial and there was uh four very specific things that would create a uh, binomial experiment which in turn would create a binomial random variable well what are the characteristics that basically make up a normal random variable normal okay well um and this applies to every normal random variable one is bell-shaped okay two has mean that we're going to call mu standard deviation that we're going to call sigma three the total area under its curve is one and then four it's symmetric uh, around the value of mu because it's bell-shaped okay um the fifth one okay the fifth one uh there's um uh there's one more that i should talk about but i want to demonstrate with with graphs and once i get to that point i will bring it up okay but we kind of have to develop the fifth one a little bit i could tell you what it is but it, it would probably be lost on you okay so let me try to develop that one a little bit once i once i develop I'll, I'll bring it up again hey this is this is the fifth point that we're trying to make here with regards to a characteristic of a continuous uh excuse me of, of a normal random variable so i have a bit of a problem okay every time either the mean changes or the standard deviation changes so either one changes you know what has to happen is that basically we have a different normal random variable okay so there's an infinite amount of normal random variables okay and if there's an infinite amount of normal random variables uh, every time mu or sigma changes we would have to make a new probability table to figure out probabilities oh that would be awful okay that would be awful and so uh mathematicians and statisticians said that's a bit of a problem we gotta we gotta figure out what to do about that we can't have a you know every time mu or sigma changes that we have to recalculate stuff okay that just doesn't make any sense okay we have to come up with a better solution than this and so let me demonstrate here is that uh so this was our example before we have a mean of 70 and a standard deviation of four for the male heights okay and there's our x uh, axis and there's our z axis okay and um remember that the probability that x is between 66 and 74 is 68 percent okay and so you know if we drew a line here drew a line there we got 68 percent of the data okay all right so now let's change the problem here instead of saying male heights let's say that we looked at female heights well female heights tend to be bell-shaped also we'll say that they have a, a mean of 64 inches and a standard deviation of three inches okay so notice here x has changed x has changed before it was whatever the mean height of males were which i think was 70. now it's what 64. the standard deviation is no longer four it's what three okay so notice the x scale has changed okay versus what it was for the males okay what hasn't changed what hasn't changed is the z-score scale okay you still have zero one two three okay negative one negative two negative three and if i drew a line right here and right here okay we know that about 68 percent of the data is between those two points so it doesn't matter what the scale of x is as long as we change the scale into a z-score scale okay so we change x's into z's how many tables would we need then we would only need what one okay because we know that between 61 and 67 for the females it's still 68 percent of the data sitting there that's the fifth characteristic okay that's the fifth characteristic and so what i mean here is that is that it doesn't matter which normal uh distribution that you're looking at it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what the what x is okay 
does not matter. All right. We know that if we go out a certain amount of standard deviations, meaning Z scores, okay, that we know that there's a um, that the same amount of area is associated with going out a certain amount of Z scores in either direction from the mean. Okay, that's the fifth characteristic. That's pretty powerful because what that means is that we only need one table now. Okay, so here's our problem and here's our solution. Create just one table that has Z scores and we call it the standard normal table. Okay, the standard normal table. Uh, uh, and so we create one Z score table with their corresponding probabilities. For every problem that is normal, we change X into Z, and then we use that one table. That's it. Okay, that's that's the idea here. Okay. All right. So now we have to talk about the standard normal random variable. This is part of the solution. So notice I underlined standard here. Um, so it, it adds a little bit to this just normal random variable. This is a special normal random variable. It has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay. And uh, it's so special in the statistical world is that uh, normally with random variables, we just call it X, right? Well, this one, we give it a Z, okay? We gave it its own letter, okay? Meaning Z scores, okay? And so we have to learn a how to use a table, okay, to look up these Z scores, okay? And that's what we're going to learn now. And so I'm going to get out and in of this table in the presentation, okay? So you have to kind of bear with me here, okay? So let's say that we look up the probability that Z is less than a negative 1.43. We need to know what this area here is and whatever we can find for that area, okay? That tells us what the probability is that Z is being less than a negative 1.43, okay? <clears throat> All right. So uh, let's go over the table. So this table you can find um, in uh, uh, the course, okay, in a, probably one or two different places. Let's see where is it? Here it is. So negative 1.43, we've got to eventually look up. All right. So um, here's, uh, here's what we got to do is, let's see, I'm reminding myself. There we go. All right. Um, first things first is that um, this is a, this actually, this table is actually two pages. So the first page, all right, notice that the Z's over here are negative, okay, because you can have negative Z scores, right? And this takes you to the first decimal place, all right? Up here, notice that uh, this, t this goes another decimal place. And so let's say that you had to look up a negative 3.01, all right? So a negative 3.01, you would just see where they come together and you see uh, a number of 0 0.0013, okay? And so I have to tell you exactly what that is. I haven't done that yet. But let's just make sure that we can look up the z-scores, okay? So on the other side here, on the other page, this is actually a page in a book that is front and back. Uh, and so on the other side here, uh, notice you have positive z-scores, okay? So let's say that we had to look up a, a positive 1.3, uh, five, 1.35. So you gotta keep in mind that the first number is zero, zero. Okay. And so five is this one, this guy over here. So 0.9115. Okay. So, um, that's the first thing is looking up the Z score. Second thing is what are the numbers in inside of here? And those are the probabilities, but probabilities of what exactly? And so to answer that question, I got to take you to the graph here. Notice the graph here. Um, so if you're working on the negative side, okay, here's zero. So the negative Z scores are over here, right? And so uh, notice what it's shaded here. It all, it's shaded in, okay, and shaded in a certain area. And it's what's the area that it's shading in? Less than. It's shading in less than, okay? It's always shading in less than. And so basically what this table is doing is this, is that it's starting at a negative infinity and it's adding up all the area up until it gets to the Z score. And this is what we call a cumulative probability that it's doing, okay? It's adding up all the probabilities up to that point. That's not how the binomial table works, okay? Um, and so uh, remember this is continuous and so the, these tables are probably gonna work differently. And so this is 
already adding up all the area up to this value of z and starting with a negative infinity. And so when you look up a negative 2.92, what it's doing is that saying, all right, negative 2.92, what is the area to the left of that? The same holds true if z is positive. Okay, notice the graph up here. It's not going to the right, it's going to the left. Okay, so if you uh, look any z score up, it's always going to give you the area to the left because it's adding up all the areas from the negative infinity up to that point of z. Okay, and that's how the table works. So let's go back here. We said we had to look up a negative 1.43. All right, negative 1.43. All right, so a negative 1.4 and uh, 3 is right here. So it looks like our answer would be 0 .07, uh, 0 0.0764. 0 0764. Uh, remember, we were looking up less than. That's what this table is always giving us. It's always giving us less than. Okay, so there's our answer, 0 0.0764. Okay, let's go to the next one. Let's say that we're trying to look up the probability that z is less than 0.48. Well, we know from 0 over to a negative infinity, that's 0.5. So we added a little bit more area to there. So it should be a little bit larger than 0.5, OK? But not too close to 1, OK? We didn't shade in, you know, practically all the graph, but, you know, just a little bit more than a half, OK? So remember, less than, that's what the table's always given us. So we should be able to just look this one straight up. So 0.48, let's go look that one up. So 0.4 and 8, I got here 0.6844. There's our answer, 0.6844, okay? Just a little bit more than 0.5, okay? But not too close to 1. All right, so less than, okay? What happens, though, if we have greater than? What do we do then? Okay, well, with greater than, um, what you got to remember uh, is that uh, if you look up 1.30, that... Remember, it's not giving you greater than, it's always giving you less than this table. And what is the, how much area is always underneath the curve? It's always one. And so if we know that the unshaded part is, say, 0.9, we know the shaded part must be what? 0.1, right? Because it all has, has to add up to one. So one minus whatever the probability that you look up. So that's one way of doing this, okay? Well, let's go ahead and, and try that. So let's look up uh, 1.30. Okay, well, we put it on our graph. Now, notice our shaded area here. It's not too large, right? Okay, certainly it's going to be less than 0.5. Okay, so let's look it up. Uh, 1.30. Okay, 1.30 right here, 0 0.9032. 0 0.9032. So, what does that mean? Point nine zero three two is this area right here this unshaded part because the book is always this table is always giving us less than so what is this area over here one minus that and so once we go ahead and put that in our calculator do that in our head whatever let's see what do we get here i got here point zero nine six eight if i did my math correctly in my head okay and there's our answer it's just a little less than 10%, okay? Now, there is another way that you could do this, and you could use the idea of what's called symmetry, right? Uh, not, uh, not every continuous random variable is perfectly symmetrical, okay? But the uh, the standard normal is, and actually every, every normal is, okay? And so what do I mean by using the idea of symmetry? Well, uh, we know that the book is always going to give us less than. And so would you agree that this area right here, there should be an exact area over here that matches this area over here? And what would be that area? It would be the probability that z is what? Less than a negative 1.3. Okay. And so there's that area. That area should match this one. And what is that associated with? A negative 1.3. And so in other words, if we went and got out of this, okay, and looked up a negative 1.3, negative 1.3, we got our answer, okay? And you don't have to do any subtracting at that point if you use the idea of symmetry, okay? Be careful. Use one or the other, or if you do understand both, fine, okay? But don't get confused with the two, okay? 
all right, let's uh, let's do one more, and then we'll move on to something else. Let's see what's the next one we got here. The probability that z is greater than or equal to a negative 2.03. So here's our graph, okay? And I shaded in a whole lot, right? Shaded in quite a bit. Okay, our answer should be close to one at this point. Practically shaded in the whole thing, okay? 100% or one, okay? But when we look up a negative 2.03 we're going to get an area, this area right here, right? We're going to get this area over here. And so uh, we got to be careful, okay? We got to be careful on, oh, geez, I moved everything around. That's all right. Uh, so we got to be careful of um, what our answer is going to be, okay? So let's take a look at a negative 2.03. Negative 2.03, let's see, it looks like point zero two one two. 0, 0, 0.0212, okay? And again, that is not our answer. That's the unshaded part, okay? So that means that in order to get uh, our answer, let's see, this is 0 0.0212, this area here, okay? To get the rest of this, this would be 1 minus 0. 0.0212. Two one two. That gives us what? Point nine seven eight eight. If I did my math right, point nine seven eight eight. Yep, there it is. Okay, point nine seven eight eight. Could you use symmetry here? Yep. Instead of looking up the negative, you would look up the positive. Okay, and uh, so you're going to look up the exact opposite. Okay, when it's greater than. Symmetry or one minus, you decide which one is best for you, okay? All right, um, notice here that in this problem, I put the equal to sign, okay? I put the equal to sign. So we gotta discuss that really quick. Um, so these two answers right here, um, notice I, I really didn't bother too much uh, when I had, uh, a equal to sign because I basically answered it like I didn't have the equal to sign there. Okay. And essentially these two things are exactly the same. And I want to show you why. Well, I, see, I can break apart the probability that Z is greater than or equal to into two pieces parts. I can break it up into this plus that. And what did we find out? The probability that any continuous random variable is equal to uh, when it, uh, it's when it's equal to a specific value. So here we got the probability that Z is equal to very specifically a negative 2.03. What's the probability of that happening? That is zero, right? Okay. This is zero right here. Okay. So that means that just goes away. So that means these two things are equal to one another. Okay. But remember, this is only for continuous random variables. Okay. And you can plainly see it here with the uh, uh, standard normal, okay? So that means if you have greater than or equal to, that's exactly the same as greater than. If you have less than or equal to, that's exactly the same as less than, okay? It's not gonna change your probabilities around because there's no probability sitting at exactly equal to a, a value. All right, look at this one. So here, this is the third type of interval interval that we can run into. Here, z is in between two values, a negative one and a positive one. Okay, negative one, positive one. I've already shaded this in. We already said this is the empirical rule, right? And so, oh, I already gave you the answer, but that's all right. Uh, so we know that this is what? About 68%. Okay, well, let's go out and figure out specifically what it is. Okay, so how are we going to figure this out uh, using our table? There's a really easy method. There are a couple of different methods, but this is probably the easiest, okay? Is that the first thing that you're going to do is you're, you're always going to look up the number to the right, and it doesn't matter what that number is. Look up that number to the right first. Look up that probability, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at that probability. So we're gonna look up one, positive one. And we got here 0 0.8413. 0.8413. Okay, so let's go ahead and put that on our graph. 
let's wait, there we go. So we got here point eight four one three. That is the area from here all the way over to a negative infinity. Okay, that's what that is. That's supposed to be a three. Here I'll <laughs> I did I did a worse job there. That's supposed to be a three. Point eight four one three. Okay. So notice that when we looked up one, basically we looked up too much area, right? We looked up from here all the way to a negative infinity. Well, we were supposed to stop here. So if we could subtract off something, we would maybe get the stuff in the middle. Well, what, what should we subtract off? We should, should subtract off what? This area right here, okay? That area right there. And so let's go ahead and look up that area. But you're saying, hold on, well, what it, what z-score should I look up? Well, it had just so happens it's associated with this this number to the left, okay, the first number, okay? So if we look up that number, that's going to give us the area from here over. And notice if you take this minus that area right there, what are you going to be left with? The stuff in the middle, okay? So uh, let's go look up a negative 1, okay? Let's go look up a negative 1. So negative 1 turns out to be, right here, 0 0.1587, 0.1587. So this is 0.1587. And what are we going to do with these two numbers? Subtract them. We're going to subtract them, okay? Now, to make this a little bit cleaner, I got this right here, okay? So we got 0.4. 8413 minus 0.1587. There we go. Okay. We got our answer and notice roughly what 68% or 0.68. Okay. This is where the empirical rule is coming from. Okay. Let's do one more. Okay. I know I know it's a little clumsy going in and out, but bear with me. Uh, so we want our z between these two values here. Okay, so here's our graph, and this is a pretty irregular shape, okay, and it's going to be less than 0.5, we know that, okay, uh, but that's pretty much all we're going to know. It's not too close to zero, but certainly less than a half, okay. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to first look up a negative, uh, we're going to look up a negative 0.54, negative 0.54. Let's go ahead and do that. Negative 0.54, 1, 2, 3, 4. I got here 0.2946. Okay, 0.2946. That's from here over. I won't write it this time, so I have to get it in and out of this. Okay, and then the next number, what are we going to look up? We're going to look up a negative 2.26. Negative 2.26. Negative 2.2. Five, six looks like this number right here, 0.0119. Okay, and so we're going to, what are we going to do with those two numbers? We're going to uh, subtract. Okay, so let me get back into the presentation. Let's go to the next slide, and there we go. Okay, we got our 0.2946 minus 0.0119, and we get 0.2827. There is our answer. Okay. Now I want you to master this table. Okay. I definitely want you to master the table. All right. Uh, but what I also want you to be able to eventually do is maybe check your answer in StackCrunch. Okay. So let's go over to StackCrunch. I want to show you in StackCrunch on how you can uh, check your answers. Let's go over there. So uh, I already had it pulled up, but let me show you. If you go to stat, calculators, these are all the different probability distributions, okay? And here is normal, right here. Okay, we'll go to normal. And it defaults to the standard normal. So it defaults to the mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, okay? And so uh, notice here, you could, uh, this is already set to less than. You can change this to greater than. 
Okay, that's the first thing. So let's say that we wanted to look up a less than, uh, I don't know, 2.27. What it's going to do, it's going to draw you a graph and give you the probability right here. Okay, there's the graph. So notice we've practically shaded in the whole thing. And there is our answer. And uh, probably we would properly round this to four decimal places and say 0.9884. Okay. You could say, obviously, uh, greater than, uh, greater than this number would be 0 0.0116. Okay. So you can put in any, any number and I'll show you on the graph. Okay. You could actually do an in-between. Here's the empirical rule. It starts, it defaults to the empirical rule, negative one to one. Okay. Uh, there's, there was our, basically our answer before, but you can do, do anything that you wanted here. Negative 2.78. Negative, oh, uh, negative, there we go, point, uh, six, seven, maybe. There we go. Okay. So it draws you a nice graph. You can see it, and there would be our answer. Okay. So you can do uh, uh, this in StackCrunch and check your answers, but let's make sure that we can read that table. Okay. Um, got any questions, let me know. Okay. But usually people, uh, are pretty comfortable with the, using the table. All right, let's continue on here. So let me get back into the presentation. How do we change x that is normal into the standard normal random variables? Remember, that was the whole purpose of this of, of doing all this, is that um, is that we have a random variable that's at that's uh, that we're going to call x, and it's normal. It doesn't have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay, those values are different than zero and one. All right. And so we have to change that into a z-score and then use our table. That's the whole purpose here. And so remember back in chapter two, we had a formula for the z-score. It was observed value minus the mean divided by a standard deviation. Observed value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Well, we're still going to use that, OK? Um, it's just that we're going to use symbols. The observed value, we're going to call x, OK? That, the x is going to come from the from the problem. And that's the value that we're trying to change over to a z-score. Mu will be given to us in the problem, and so will be sigma. Okay, and so in this chapter right here, z will be equal to x minus mu divided by sigma. Yeah, uh, do this prop. Let's take a look at this and apply the standard normal table. It says here the diameter of a certain type of tree in a forest is normally normally distributed. So don't don't freak out um, if you see normal or normally distributed mean exactly the same thing. What does it mean? Is that the random variable, and what's the random variable here? It's the diameter of this certain tree, okay? That's that's x in the problem, okay? That's the random variable x. And it, when it says it's normal, it means that x has all those characteristics of a normal distribution, okay? So if it says it's normal or normally distributed, okay, that's what it's talking about, okay? So it says here that it has a mean of 34.5 with a standard deviation of 8.4 centimeters. It says here, assume these values are for all the trees of this type in the forest. So that's for the entire population, okay? And the question says, what's the probability that we randomly choose a tree of this type and it has a diameter greater than 50 centimeters? Well, let's classify some things first. Let's label some stuff, okay? What did we find out? We found out that mu is equal to 34.5, sigma is equal to 8.4, and ultimately, okay, and x, remember, is that tree type diameter. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what is the probability that x is greater than 50. Why? Because, well, what's the probability that uh, the diameter of any one of those trees is greater than 50 centimeters? Okay. I think we can go ahead and figure this out. So in our formula here, the 50 is going to be the x that we want to change. Here's mu, 34.5, here's sigma, okay? Once that's calculated, we get 1.845. And so what that means is that the probability that x is greater than 50 is the same as the probability that z is greater than 1.845, okay? So by the way, this sign right here, so when I say this sign, this guy right here, all right, it will not flip on us, okay? Uh, in algebra, don't, 
the time that this flips is when you multiply or divide by a negative number. We are dividing by a number, but it's sigma, and sigma is never negative. It's always going to be a positive number. Okay, it could be zero, but probably not. Um, it's going to be a positive number, and so this sign will not flip on us. Okay, so if it's greater than, it's going to stay greater than. Okay, and so you have your options on what to do at this point. Since we came up with one uh, one point eight four five, okay. The first option is I want to make sure that you're able to do that. And I would say go ahead and um, uh, use a standard normal table and round to two decimal places properly. So remember the standard nor normal table that I gave you only goes to two decimal places, and so you would have to round this properly, and you would round it up to 1.85 because this is this third number is five or greater. Okay, and so uh, I would look up 1.85. Okay, and so you would, you would go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and take a look. 1.85. Let's see. 1.85. You can use the idea symmetry. That's fine too. So one, two, three, four, five. I got here 0.9. 678. So remember, it's greater than, so we're going to have to take 1 minus that. So 1 minus point, uh, 0.9678 is 0 0.0322. 0 0.0322. All right. So that's uh, what we would get if we use the table. If we use stack crunch, you're going to get a slightly different answer. Okay. 1.845. you get just ever so slightly different answer. You get 0 0.0325. Okay, so it just depends on how precise that you want it. Can you use the table? If you can, great. If you need it to be a little bit more precise than that, you can go over to Stack Crunch. Notice it's barely going to be different, okay? It's rarely going to be significantly different from one another. No matter if you use the tables or if you use Stack Crunch. And so let's go back here. And so, uh, if, again, if we looked at the table, we got 0.0322. If we use stack crunch, we got 0 0.0325. Notice hardly a difference. Okay, just depends on how how uh, how uh, uh, precise you need it to be. Okay, all right, let's move on. Make sure you know know how to use the tables though. All right, uh, let's now apply the standard normal table. Remember, the whole purpose of this was to change axes and disease, right? Okay. Uh, and so let's work on part B here. All right, what's the probability that we randomly choose a tree of this type and it has a di diameter less than 29.964? Notice we can get really crazy with these numbers. It doesn't matter. It's all simple math. It's all simple arithmetic, okay? And so we go ahead and put in 29.964 for our x. We subtract off mu, divide by sigma. We get uh, a negative 0.54. That means that the probability that x is less than 29.964 is equal to the probability that z is less than negative 0.54. Okay, and so those are equivalent to one another; they're equal. Okay, so you can go ahead and look that one up. Uh, I'll, I'll let you look it up on your own. Okay, um, but I think if you did, I think you would find an answer of 0.2946. Okay, what would happen uh, on this one right here? Uh, notice I have what's the probability, okay, what's the probability that tree has a diameter between 35 and 45 centimeters. So notice I wrote it mathematically out. So what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to change both the 35 and the 45 into z scores. So I've gone ahead and did that, okay. Notice I got the 35 here. That 35 changed into 0 0.06. The 45 changed into 1.25. And so those are equivalent to one another. Okay, so notice the 35. It's now 0 0.06, 45 to 1.25. Okay, there we go. And we can look that one up. All right, I'll let you look that one up on your own. All right, but I think if you did the math there, I came up with 0.3705. If you do this through Stack Crunch, which I did not do, uh, you might get something just ever so slightly bigger or smaller, or you might get that exact answer. And when I say uh, 
it's it's rounding error at this point in stack crunch it might be 0.3704 or 5 or, or 6. Uh, it would be very 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 close to that answer though okay but i'll let you do that on your own okay <clears throat> all right so now uh the last portion of this section is that um what we're going to do is we're going to solve for x knowing the probability okay knowing the probability so notice in the problems that we've been doing what i've been giving you is x you changed it into a z score and then you found the probability okay that's the prior prior problems what about the problems coming up well these problems uh coming up actually i just have one problem is that we're going to start with the probability we change it over into a z-score and figure out x and so notice we flip the process here i give you the probability you go look up the z-score associated with that probability and then <clears throat> go find <clears throat> excuse me go find the x uh using algebra So here's the problem. Let's assume an owner of a pit bull terrier goes to the vet with her dog. Before, uh, well, it should be going to the vet, uh, you find out that a male pit bull terrier on average weighs 50 pounds with a standard deviation of 5 pounds, and you find out that the weights are normal from the, from the vet. The vet weighs the dog and puts the weight into the computer. The vet states that your dog is overweight because it has a percentile rank of 90%. How much does the dog weigh? So notice I gave you terms of percentile. And remember what percentiles do. It gives you, uh, it, you know, remember if like if you were taking the SAT and you scored in the 86 percentile, you did better than 86 percent of everybody that took it. That so basically, if you're in the 90th percentile, okay, your dog weighs more than, uh, or this particular owner, uh, her dog weighs more than 90 percent of all the uh, pit bull terriers. Okay, and so <clears throat> how are we going to figure this one out? So notice I gave you the probability. And what was the probability here? It's 90%. Okay, it's 90%. And so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to use that probability, go find the appropriate Z that's associated with it, and then go change that into an X, okay, by using a little bit of algebra. Okay, so... Uh, I think that probably the easiest way to do this is to get into Stack Crunch. Okay, and let's see here. Let's get into Stack Crunch. So uh, here's a standard normal. Now, here's the cool thing about this is that uh, it doesn't just give you uh, this this number right here always. If you fill in the probability it will give you the value associated with that particular z which is kind of kind of nice okay so in other words uh here we can go ahead and change this to a less than or equal to sign because 90 percentile okay areas you know we got a observation we got 90 percent of the um uh 90 percent of the observations before it that's smaller in value okay and we know that this value is 0.9 and so if you go ahead and hit compute, it'll give you the appropriate z-score associated with it. So it turns out to be 1.28155516. So notice it gave you a graph. You got 90% of the data uh, less than it. If you wanted to look up the 80, I don't know, uh, 83rd percentile, boom. The z-score associated with that would be 0.9541655. Uh, Okay, and certainly if you want to look up a, a percentile ranking that was below 0.5, it's going to be a, a negative z-score, right? So 43rd percentile, there's there's the z-score there. Okay, uh, you could also change this around, um, not to complicate things, but if let's say that uh, instead of 0.9, okay, you could also do top 10, but you got to be careful. Okay, instead of doing 90 percentile. Uh, what you could do is you could do the top 10, okay, top 10%. Oh, I put in point. Uh, there we go. Uh, but instead of less than, what do we want? We want greater than, okay? And it will go ahead and figure it out for us. And notice it's the same number as putting in less than 0.9, okay? It's 1.281516, right? Same number, okay? 
So there's the Z score associated with a 90 percentile ranking. OK, and now we can go back to our problem. Yep, uh, there we go. And here it is. And so from StackCrunch, we found there's the Z score. OK, and so notice I went and put I use this formula right here. OK, so we fill in 1.28, uh, 15516 for Z. Here's x minus the 50 divided by sigma. And let's see, we're going to solve for x, so we're going to multiply both sides by 5, OK? And then add 50 to both sides. That's what I did over here, OK? And what do you get? You get 56.4 pounds, OK? And that's what the uh, vet is saying. Um, unfortunately, your dog weighs, OK? Time to, time to walk it more, put it on the treadmill, whatever, OK? But it weighs a little bit too much because it weighs 90% more than all the other uh, pit bull terriers, uh, probably for its uh, particular gender. Okay. All right. So that ends uh, this section. Thank you for your time.